Okay, welcome to the second part of lecture 18. Uh, well, now we dive into authentication authorization. Um, and there are many different ways to do that. So we just look at some common ones and discuss them a bit. But of course, this is a topic that if you really want to build this into a productive website, uh, productive backend, you need to spend quite some time and effort to get this right. Uh, since the whole purpose is to keep people from doing what they're not supposed to do. Now, we start off with HTTP basic. Uh, that's a basic user and password authentication. Uh, you, whenever you send a request to the server, you send your user and your password via the HTTP headers. So there is a header, a standard HTTP header that is called authorization, uh, and you just add the information there. So let's assume we make a request to our server uh, and the regular request will not be successful because the server expects that we use uh, basic authentication. So what you do is you add the authorization header uh, saying basic, so that's the basic uh, method. And then uh, there is a string here and that's our user and password. Now this looks pretty uh, encrypted, but it's important to, to make clear that it's not. Uh, this is actually just an encoding. So this is just a way to uh, get the user and password down to a, to one string. Uh, and you can inverse this. So just because this looks very cryptic doesn't make it safe or secure anyhow. So if I just take this text string, uh, I find a base64 decoder uh, and I say, please decode this string, then you'll see it says Grisha Cologne, my super secret password. Uh, so it's just a decoding. There is nothing secret here. Um, so that's how you use it. And then on the server side, you would check, does this header exist? If it exists, is it the right authentication method? If it is, then uh, use base64 to get the actual text string and check whether the user and password are correct. Uh, so that's really all you do. And then if that's the case, you send a proper response. Otherwise you say no, uh, probably 401 or 403 forbidden, uh, not authenticated. You are not allowed to use this. Uh, all of it is of course sent in clear text. So there's nothing secret here. Uh, one issue here is that in every single request you have to send your user and your password and uh, the chance is just very high that over time someone might intercept one of your requests, might read one of your requests, uh, and then they have your user credentials so they can always uh, use it in the future unless you change your password. Uh, and this is of course a problem because passwords are very often reused and can also be uh, guessed. So you can just try maybe different applications. Does the same password work if I try to log into Gmail or anything else? So uh, that's a problem. So what is used instead often is to say, uh, the first time you send a request, you have to send your user and password, the server checks it, uh, and then the server sends you back some token, some kind of field, some kind of string that you use from then on. Uh, so you don't have to send your user and your password. Uh, so those are token-based uh, authentication methods and we'll uh, introduce them later on. Now I'll just quickly give you an example how this works implemented on the server side. So if we go into uh, Express, and this is something that I'll upload, this is the material I'll upload. There is a plugin that is called Express Basic Auth that just builds basic authentication into uh, an Express server. And it's fairly easy to use that. So you just import the module as I did here. Um, and then you just tell Express to use basic auth as a middleware. So this is just a regular middleware that checks every request that comes in. Uh, and it expects a list of user credentials. Um, here it's just hard coded. So that's not very, first of all, it's not flexible. I cannot add or remove users. And the other problem is that of course, I don't wanna have this in my code. So in a real system, this should come from a database somehow. Uh, that's nothing we go into here, but uh, you should of course not just hard code the users here. Uh, but this is just to, to demonstrate that this works. And after this statement, every endpoint I implement will require uh, an authentication. So here I have one endpoint uh, slash a get 
Uh, this one will only work if I send the credentials. Before that, I have another endpoint slash front end. If I access this one, then there is no authentication required. So let's try that. Uh, I need a terminal to start with. Um, and I have it in my slides. So now this is started. If I go to uh, localhost 3000 slash front end, uh, I get this horrible looking application. Um, that works. If I go to slash, I will not get anything. And if you look at the details, uh, what I get is a 401. So the server says, sorry, you are uh, not authorized, you're unauthorized, you cannot access this. Uh, if we want to change that, we have to send the user and password and we can do that via postman. Um, just to show you in detail how this looks like. So let's say we create a new request. Uh, we get HTTP localhost 3000 slash. Uh, if I send this, I'll again get unauthorized. Now, if I add the right header, then it will work. Uh, and Postman allows me a shortcut here. I can actually go into authorization uh, and then choose basic auth. So that's exactly what I want to have. And we want admin and super secret. Uh, I think that's, yes, that's exactly what I had. Uh, so if I do this now, then uh, I'll get 200 okay, welcome. So the server has actually checked this. And just to make sure I can put another password in and you'll see that I get 401 unauthorized. So it actually does check what's in here. It does not only check whether or not the uh, header is there. So that's basic authentication. Um, as discussed, it's not ideal because you can uh, steal passwords. The chance is much higher. So instead, you typically have token IDs uh, and one way of implementing them is session IDs. The way this works is that first you authenticate yourself. So the first request is, for example, using HTTP basic authentication. Um, and then the server sends back a response and says, yes, you are authenticated, you are logged in. Uh, but Additionally, the server sets a cookie. So it says, okay, in your client now, please set the cookie SID is five. Um, and this is now the token. This is the ID you will use from now on. Uh, so the next time the user sends a, re uh, a request, and there should be an arrow here. Uh, the next time the user does not send any password or user uh, name, the user just sends this cookie back. Uh, and this is something that happens automatic because of cookies. So the cookie is being sent and then the server checks, does session number five exist? If it does, you can also load all the data, all the things you have, you know about the user or the user has been doing or so on. Um, so this is one way of doing it. Five is, is not a very good session ID. Usually this is some kind of cryptic string so that you cannot guess it. Uh, because as we discussed in lecture two, cookies you can change. So we can just change it to six, for example. And uh, so the server should make sure this is a number that is not guessable just like that. Um, this is a stateful implementation because uh, if we go back here, you'll see that uh, there is a difference whether I have set the cookie or not. So it actually depends on previous requests. Uh, so we have built a stateful implementation this is a conflict with the REST principle. So this would not be RESTful. Uh, that's a disadvantage. As we discussed, the problem with stateful implementations is that uh, debugging, for example, testing is much, much harder. The other thing is, of course, just like the user and password, uh, if someone reads your request, they can steal your session ID. And then uh, they can use it. So they can use requests with your session ID and they will be successful. Uh, that's a problem. But uh, usually there are other ways to, to get around that. The other thing is, of course, if you have uh, 
if you have very easy session IDs like one, two, three, four, five, you can guess them very easily, and then that's also a security risk. Um, the general case that you often see of a session ID is a so-called token. So basically we're talking about data, about a string that you use instead of the user password credentials. Uh, and that's really to avoid that credentials are being sent back and forth. Uh, the most common kind of token that you see and use is, is the bearer token. Uh, that just means that anyone who has the token, anyone who carries it, uh, has access to the API. One example of that is PayPal. They use bearer tokens. Uh, most applications uh, that use authentication where you log in, Facebook, Gmail, uh, all the big ones, they use bearer tokens. So this is by far the, the most general uh, standard. And the way it works is again, as before, we have some kind of authentication. We log in with basic authentication or here PayPal uses OAuth2, we discuss that later. But in some way where you send, here's my user, here's my password, please log me in. Uh, and then you get a token back. So you get some kind of string back. Again, this should not be a string that is easy to guess. Uh, you get this back. And then in all your pr uh, future requests, for example, when you want to make a payment, uh, you say authorization. Instead of basic, this time you say bearer. And then you just put this token in there. So you have a string that you use uh, to log in. We can uh, look at that again in Postman because I had this... Uh, I showed PayPal at some point. Uh, we'll just see whether I still find it. PayPal token. Uh, this is actually the request where I get my token. So somewhere in the body here is my authorization information and I will not show that to you. But when I send, I, I say, okay, I'm this user uh, and then I get something back. So I'll get something back uh, here's my access token. That's the string that I can use. Uh, so as you see, this is very cryptic. This is hard to guess. Uh, that's essentially my, my token that I now use to say I am allowed to do something. Uh, in case someone tries to copy this, I will of course make sure that the token is not valid anymore when you are watching this video. So don't try. It's not working. Uh, and now the next time when I, for example, say get payments, um, I actually send this token to the server. So this is just a placeholder in Postman, but basically I say bearer and I put the text string in there that I want to use. Uh, so that's what I'll do. And then the server will say yes or no, uh, it worked. So most likely this is because I have used the token. If I remove this, then I think it says unauthorized exactly. So here's my authorization information. Uh, that I'm using now. And now if someone listens to my request, uh, if someone copies this, they get the token, but they don't know my password. So they only have the token. And that's a very good thing because um, there are a couple of sort of safety measures built into the tokens. The first one is tokens typically expire. So they have a certain validity, for example, a couple of hours and then they are deleted on the server. So if someone gets my request, they can copy the token, but they can only use it for a couple of hours and then it's gone. Uh, and then they cannot get a new token unless they listen to my connection again. The other thing is uh, tokens usually have a scope. So on your API, you can implement this in a way that one token is only valid, for example, for payments. Uh, and nothing else. And then if someone steals it, that's bad, but they can still only access the payment. They might not be able to do other things. So it's not like they directly get full access to your account. Uh, so that's some kind of safety built into the token system. Um, so these are tokens. Uh, there are, just in case you're interested, there are lots of different uh, token implementation. So for example, there's one that is fairly popular that is called the JSON web token, JWT, in case you have seen that. So it's just different ways of generating, of representing these kind of text strings. Okay, uh, 
We still have this already the first authentication. So in the beginning, you have to send the user and a password. And we discussed that the HTTP basic authentication is not that safe because it's clear text and it's easy to actually get this wrong in your, uh, in your server impl implementation. So uh, there is something called OAuth2, which is sort of the industry standard of doing this. Um, and the principle is you delegate the authentication to someone that has sort of has the resources, has the know-how to implement this in a good way. Uh, and that's exactly what you have on all the websites that say, hey, you can sign into this with Google or you can sign in with GitHub or anything else. Uh, this is basically OAuth2. So you say um, someone else should handle the authentication they then tell you, yes, the user is the, the person he or she is saying, uh, and then they can use your application. There are a, a lot of different access scenarios in OAuth 2. So if you're interested, there is a whole lot to, to read up. Um, I'll just show you at the most, I'll, I'll just show you the most basic one and the most common one. Uh, so there are others. The way this works is you have an application. So this is your application you are writing. In this case, we use GitLab. So assume we are writing GitLab. We are the GitLab developers. There is some kind of API, like a RESTful API that uh, the user wants to get access to and you have to handle authentication. So make sure that only the right people get access to the right resources. Uh, and then we have an authorization server. So we use some kind of industry standard, some company that has implemented this. And this works then as follows. I say, I want to go to gitlab.com. I want to use the API and I say, please log me in with Google. Uh, GitLab then redirects me to a special Google URL where I have to enter my user and password. You all know this, right? If I click sign in with Google, I come to the Google Gmail looking page and I have to enter my Gmail account and password. Um, if this is successful, then the authorization server will connect to GitLab. So it will actually send the token we have discussed to GitLab um, before. And then if this is successful, your original, uh, your original request will get the response uh, with the token. So we'll say, here is your token, this has worked. So this basically may, means Google is handling the authentication. Uh, GitLab only gets a token. It does not get any of our information. GitLab never gets to see our user or our password. So they don't need to worry about it. They don't need to check in their database whether the password is correct. That's all handled by Google. And then we get a token back and then we can actually make a request to the GitLab API with that token. Uh, and GitLab then only checks whether the token we are sending is the same that they got from Google originally. That's all they do. Uh, so that's OAuth. Uh, it's a fairly nice thing and it's very standard. As you know, of most websites have something like this nowadays. If you're interested, um, there are lots of uh, libraries, for example, for, uh, for Node. So if you just search for OAuth Node, then you'll find all different. Here's, for example, an overview on the original OAuth page, what kind of libraries are there for client and server to implement this. Uh, just so you're aware of this, it's not always very easy to implement that. So it, it might, even with a library, it might take you some time to get this running. Okay, um, so this is what we do. This is, I would say, the industry standard. Uh, you have, you start off with an OAuth2 authorization, you get a token, uh, and then you use this bearer token to authorize yourself in the API. So that's how many applications nowadays work. Uh, the, all the big websites with login are operating based on this. There are, however, still some issues we have. Um, and one of them is all kinds of credentials can be stolen, everything, whether it's user password, whether it's a token, a session ID, an OAuth2 access token, which is just a, another form of a token, so there's nothing different here. 
all of this can somehow be stolen, intercepted, and then it can be used. So let's say I'm making a, a request to PayPal, I want to do a payment and I say, here is my token. What could happen is that someone, for example, in the same network manages to, uh, to read my request, manages to copy my token. Uh, and now what happens is that that attacker can of course send his or her own requests and just adds uh, the stolen token and this will be okay. So PayPal will say, yeah, great. Thanks, Grisha, you just transferred half a million to some dodgy account. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, that will always be a problem because you somehow have to send your information across the internet. So one thing again is definitely use HTTPS so that this is not clear text. Uh, but even so, things can be stolen and that's a problem. Uh, there is one other way of uh, making this a bit safer, which is called request signing, which we look into now. Uh, request signing has uh, has specific use cases, so it's usually not used for kind of front end client side things. It's often used when uh, one server, one backend talks to another one, uh, and we'll we'll get into why that is the case. But what happens is um, that I have a request I want to send. For example, I want to do a put request to some URL. Uh, with content type JSON, doesn't matter. Any kind of request. And the server, the receiver, wants to make sure that this request is really coming from me. Um, and I write Amazon here because Amazon is one of the big users of this technology. Um, what I have is a so-called secret. It's called a secret and not a password because the, the difference to a password is that the server, Amazon, also knows my secret. Uh, if we talk about usernames and passwords, usually you always say the server should never save the password in clear text. So Gmail, for example, should not know my password. They just store it in, a, in an encrypted version. Here for the secret is different. Amazon and me, we both know that my secret is my secret. Uh, so this is the text string and that's important because Amazon needs to use that password as well. Uh, what happens is I take my request, I take this string put slash quote slash Nelson blah 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 and I create a hash of it. Then I send my request, I send the put request to the server and I include the hash that I have created. Um, so I send the request and then Amazon, the server, creates the same hash again using my secret and checks whether they are identical. Uh, if they are, it means the request I've sent is actually the same that I have hashed here and that means I'm the real sender. That might be a bit cryptic, so we'll go into details. Um, Let's assume we have uh, the following request. I want to do a post request to slash users content type JSON, and this is the body. Uh, I want to create a new user called Alice. She's 33 and her password is secret. Uh, and now I have this string that is called my secret. Again, in practice, this is a very long text string that I get. Um, and what I do now is I use a hash function to do request signing. Uh, and in this particular case, this is just one uh, technology called HMAC. Uh, but what you can do, there are generators online, there are libraries to do that, but you put some kind of string in there. Uh, for example, this one. And you put a secret key in here, my secret, and then you choose a algorithm, for example, SHA-256 is one that is supposed to be safe. And then I say compute. Uh, and then I get a string. What has happened, uh, what a hash function does, it, it takes an input here. The input is somehow this text, somehow combined with the secret key. Uh, and it creates a string that is of a specific length. So it doesn't matter how much text I put in here. Uh, now I've just copied and pasted this a lot. I will always get a string that has the same length. So you see that the length has, or it has not changed. 
Uh, and the important thing is, if I put in the same string, I will get the same output. So if I compute this 100 times, I will always get the same output. Um, this means if I take this string and I put my secret here and I press compute, I get a certain string. And if Amazon does the same thing on their server, they will also get the same string. If I put anything else in there, if I, for example, say delete, then you'll see that this string differs. Now let's see, 063, 745, uh, you'll see that it's somehow different. There is a different, different value came out. Uh, that's essentially what our hash function is doing. So the hash function makes sure the input string is mapped to some kind of fixed length string. The same input is always mapped to the same string and different inputs are mapped to different strings. That's what we call a perfect hash function if this is really the case. Um, so what happens is I take my post request as I've just shown you. I take this text string, I use my secret, I use this HMAC algorithm and I create a hash. Then I send this request to Amazon and I put my hash string into the header. I say authorization HMSC, here is your string. I send it to Amazon. Amazon gets this request, so they say, okay, this is what we get. They know my secret, so what they do now is they take this request, they, they remove the authorization, so they, they take exactly the same values that I took, uh, put it into the HMAC generator, and they get a text string out. And what they now do is they compare what I have sent them to what they just generated. Um, if they are the same, they accept the request. If they are different, they decline it. Uh, and this means that you can only send exactly the same request. Otherwise, the hash function will produce a different result and it will say no. So if, for example, I'm an evil attacker now and I send post users, but I put my own body in there. I change the, the username, I change the age, I change the password. Uh, but since I don't know the secret code, I cannot regenerate this hash. So I just send the same value. If now Amazon takes this, generates the hash function, uh, it will get a different text string. And then if they compare the two, they will say, okay, they are not the same. So we actually decline the request. Um, the impact of this is if you listen to my request, if anyone intercepts this request, um, what they can do is they can do a so-called replay attack. They can, they can send exactly the same request again and it will work. But if they anyhow change the request, if they change the method, if they change the URL, if they change the body, then the request will be declined because the authorization is wrong. So you have made sure that by signing, you have created uh, basically a unique request that cannot be changed. So what you can do is you can uh, send the same request again. That's called a replay attack. You basically replay the request, uh, but you can never change it. So the user, uh, the, the attacker can only do exactly the same thing that you did. The attacker cannot do anything else. Um, and that's really a good thing. So basically it can only be sent again. It cannot change. Uh, one thing we can do to, to make this even harder is if we in our hashing function also include the current date, uh, then the server can uh, also make sure that we can only replay this within a certain time. So we can, for example, say each request is only allowed to uh, be accepted within five minutes. Uh, and then the attacker has to send the same request within five minutes, uh, otherwise the server will say no. Uh, the disadvantage, every kind of method has a disadvantage. The disadvantage we have here is that both parties have to have the same secret, the same text string, and that somehow needs to be exchanged. And now this exchange is again a, a potential attack point because someone can uh, intercept this. For example, if Amazon says, here is your secret text string, 
someone might be able to read that and then it's the same as a password they can just use it uh, what what companies like Amazon try to do to avoid this is that they change it over another channel so instead of using uh, the same HTTP request response they send you the secret in an email for example uh, or on a different website or so on and then it's much harder for the for the attacker to both check your email and listen to your HTTP connection or so on. Um, the other problem which is not in here is that uh, you have to enter the secret somewhere because you get it for example in an email uh, and that's why we often don't use this in front-end applications because it's a very long text string it's not like a password that you can remember so it's often used when you for example from one backend you use an API in another backend uh, then we use these technologies. They're not very often used for kind of end user things. Uh, as already discussed, Amazon AWS uses this technique to make sure that uh, you are allowed to use uh, their API. Again, there are some libraries for this. Uh, not much. You probably have to implement this yourself. So there are libraries for HMAC generation. So the how to compute this value. Uh, but the check on the server side whether this is the correct stuff is something you need to implement. There are some uh, basic applications on, on GitHub. So this is uh, the conclusion of lecture 18. There are lots of attack surfaces we can, uh, we can use, an attacker can use to mess with us. Uh, they can look at the network, they can try to listen to our request, they can exploit our applications if we have bugs, if we have vulnerabilities. And finally, they can try to get through the user to somehow, for example, get their password. Once again, a reminder that HTTP is completely unencrypted, so you should not use this. Uh, use always HTTPS. And finally, do not assume that just because you use HTTPS, you are safe. Uh, so there are always issues there. Uh, governments spying on you, bugs in SSL, for example. So there are lots of options. Uh, so on top of that, you, you should try to use an authentication method that is somehow secure. Uh, I've shown you some of them. All have their trade-offs. So HTTP basic is, for example, is very easy, is very quick, but you send your password in every request. So that's maybe not the best thing. Uh, one thing that you should be doing is rely on well-tested libraries and authentication delegation. So for example, use OAuth to zero if you can, use libraries that have a lot of users that have, for example, either a lot of stars on GitHub or lots of downloads on Node.js so that you can make sure that these things are tested. Uh, it's not something that some dude in his basement wrote on a weekend. So make sure these things are properly tested and used. And that's it for lecture 18. In the next lecture, we actually then go into the problems we might be having, security vulnerabilities, attacks, uh, some remarks in detail on Node.js, but we'll look at uh, kind of the top vulnerabilities we see in applications. So thank you for listening and see you in lecture 19.